our Father in heaven, the scriptures are clear that you moved by your spirit, the holy men of faith, men that submitted their lives to you in obedience and heard you. Their ears were inclined to your voice to the extent that you spoke once and twice they heard. And they wrote down what you prescribed and gave to them in form of revelation for us, that we may walk in righteousness and in knowledge, that we may be wise, that when you come, we may shine like the brightness of the firmament. And so, loving Father, even us, the recipients of this word, this evening, we come before you and ask you, our Father, to anoint us with your Holy Spirit, that we might appreciate the revelation that you have given, that it may be of value to us as we prepare for Jesus' second coming. This is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Now, in this picture, you have the ancient of days, recognized as the Father, shining in his glory. And then you have a man, who is called the Son of Man, approaching the ancient of days on the clouds. And the clouds are carrying him towards God the Father. And the Bible says that he came and he stood before God Almighty, and then the following happened to this man. The Bible says to us, then this man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all people of nations and tongues and languages should serve this man. Now, this is very interesting. Because this is a man. To the extent that he's even a son of. He's not only a man, but he's a son of. So that means this man. But then the Bible says there is a man God has chosen and is going to give him dominion, glory, kingdom, and also power that not some, but all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Now let me remind you about the sequence. In Daniel chapter 7 verse 1, Daniel receives the vision and he writes them down and says, the first thing I saw was a beast. It was like a lion with eagle's wings mm -hmm. that also passed. Then I saw a bear. It was inclined on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth that also passed. Then I saw a leopard with four heads and four wings of the eagle and it was so swift and it was so melancholy. And so I saw it and I said, that is true, but I was still watching. Then there was a fourth beast. Terrible, terrifying. I have never seen a thing like that. And guess what? It had ten horns. And then others were still watching. Three of them were plucked out. And then there came a little horn. Now this little horn was so strange because it had eyes. Mm -hmm. This little horn was so strange, it had mouth, a mouth. Then as I was still watching, I was wondering what the mouth is going to say. And I heard things I've never heard. It was blasphemous. It began to speak pompously, not against human beings, but against God himself. I caught my mouth. I said, wow. And then I was still watching. And then I realized that it was not only that. The little horn became so aggressive that it began to persecute people. And I noticed that those people are people who believe in the God the Father. I said, mm, this is strange. I was still watching. Then I saw the same thing, taking the holy law of God and changing it. Then I said to myself, Daniel, this little horn, will it go on challenging God like this? And I was still watching in the night vision. God said, it's not finished. As the little horn is still doing its business, heaven sat and the courts were arranged. And I saw a throne coming and there was an ancient of days on the throne. And as I was still watching, the son of man comes. And as he comes, God gives him dominion, power, glory, and the kingdom. The question, and the Bible says, this man's kingdom is everlasting and his dominion is everlasting dominion. It shall not pass away and the kingdom shall not be destroyed. Why? Because Babylon was destroyed, the lion. 
Med and Persia was destroyed, the bear. The Greek kingdom was destroyed, which was represented by the leopard. And Daniel, and the fourth kingdom is going to be destroyed based on the prophecy. But Daniel realizes that the last kingdom that will be established by God will never be destroyed. And that means whoever finds himself in this kingdom will never be destroyed. The question is, who is this son of man? Well, let Daniel speak to us about Daniel, after experiencing this, began to experience a few instances of this son of man or this man. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 15 and 16, after Daniel receiving a revelation and a vision, the Bible says to us in verse 15, Then it happened. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Now, if you read that text, it is strange. Daniel says, I was still perplexed with the vision God had given me, which we'll discuss tomorrow. And then, as I was watching, confused, I saw an appearance of a man. And then this man is strange. He gives orders to Gabriel. You know Gabriel? Where Lucifer left a vacuum, Gabriel filled it. So Gabriel is the covering cherub on the throne of God. Gabriel is the chief messenger of God himself. Now, Gabriel is receiving instruction from a man. It's like with a Mazire, foolish man like me, standing in front of an angel and saying, you angel, tell him the meaning. I must have boldness. Eh? And so by this experience, Daniel begins to experience that this man is different. And if you notice the Bible, if you read your Bible, you notice that this word, I had the voice of a man, eh? and this one. They are standing there straight, but this one is tilted. And the reason is in the language, there is a distinction between this man and this man. If you read the King James and you find italics, sometimes it's because that word is not in the original, but it is supplied because it's implied in the original. But here in this case, the author wants you to know that there's a difference between Daniel and this man. Because this man is giving orders to Gabriel. Now, there is another text. When you read Daniel 10 verse 1, Daniel experiences another experience of this man. The Bible tells us in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel whose name was called Belshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long. And Daniel understood the message, and he had understanding of the vision. But verse 2 says, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth. Nor did I anoint myself at all until three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was guarded with gold of Ufas. And then he adds, this man I saw had the appearance, his body was like a burial. His face like the appearance of the lightning. His eyes like the torches of fire. And then he adds, his arms and his feet like the burnished bronze and in color. And the sound of his word like the voice of many, many waters. Or multitudes of waters or peoples. And so Daniel sees this man in a new fashion. The previous time he had the voice. He saw the appearance and had the voice. Now G, or this man appears to him in a more 
expansive way and a profound way. And the Bible says, and I, Daniel, alone saw, and when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Now let me tell you something. The day you will meet that man in his glory, are you with me? You can meet him in his flesh. But the day you will meet that man in his glory, you will have no strength. You you know, I've always told people, the reason some of us are the way we are, cold and, you know, faith does not make sense, is because we have not had a vision. When Paul saw that man on the way to Damascus, When he saw that man and looked up and said, Who are you, my Lord, that I persecute? And Jesus said, I am the Christ whom you persecute. Paul, from that moment, never was the same again. They stoned Paul to death, and Paul was not reacting. He was saying, you can kill me if you want. They beat up Paul, and Paul was saying, you can add more. Because he had seen a man. And when you see that man, your pride. Paul was an arrogant man. But when he saw Jesus in his glory, his arrogance, his pride went. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 2, he says, All the gain I had, I count it by loss only to know the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. When you see the man in his glory. <laughs> I always pray for some of you to, you know when I was here, I had the privilege of having a vision when Christ was calling me. I was also arrogant. But when I saw his glory, that's why me, I'm nobody anymore. You can step on me the way you want. I will always tell Jesus, I'm thankful that I'm worthy the scorn for your name. Because I am nobody. I am just but the chief of Sinners. Thank God that he came to save me. And the Bible says, therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision. And no strength remained in me. For my vigor turned into frailty and I fell on my face to the ground. The Bible says, yet I heard the sound of his words. And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Now, Daniel was a, a, a prime minister, not so. He was a nobleman. He was the third in command in Babylon at the time, based on the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. Based on the prophecy or the experience of Daniel chapter 5, even Belshazzar had promoted him. Based on Daniel chapter 6, even Darius had promoted him. He was the distinguished among all the governors. Yet here before Jesus Christ is nothing. You know, there's something interesting about Jesus. The Bible tells us he was putting on a linen. The question is, why is this man putting on a linen? And the answer is simple because from Daniel chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, where we are going, the issue is going to be about the sanctuary. And so Jesus appears to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10 in the garment of a priest because Leviticus 16, chapter 16, verse 4 says, he shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. That is the priest. He shall be guarded with the linen sash. In this case, it is the golden belt. He shall be, and with the linen turban, he shall be attired. These are the holy garments, therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. Then in Leviticus chapter 16 verse 23 the Bible says, Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting and shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there, you know. He would put them on, enter the holy place and when he's coming up he has to remove them, leave them there and get out. So in this place, this man that appears to Daniel is dressed in linen, invoking the priestly robe, and he wants to tell us that he's a priest. But the question is, a priest of what? And Daniel is about to find out. But let us establish another premise. 
Come with me to the book of Revelation. Let's uh, tackle something because we want to establish who is this man. The book of Daniel, of Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, John receives the revelation. The angel explains to him a few things about the, the end time and the beast and uh, what will be the end of Babylon. And after that, after the great vision and explanation, John is so amazed and he looks at the angel in his brightness and John realizes that this angel is exceedingly powerful. So he falls down to worship the angel. And the Bible says in verse 10, and I fell at his feet, that is the angel, to worship him. But the angel said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of the brethren who have testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, this angel says to Revelation, to, to, to John, don't worship me. Though I am very bright, but only one person deserves the worship. And you remember yesterday the Bible told us, God says, I am the Lord and that is my name. I shall not share my glory with any other person. So the angel says, no one should be worshipped except God. And then John has not learned his lesson. You know it's always in the human nature to worship those that excel their imagination. And so in Revelation 22 verse 8, John again after receiving the revelation says, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then again, the angel tells John, you must learn this principle because it is key. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren, the, in other words, prophets, angels, and everyone else, including pastors, we are servants of God. No one deserves the praise except so the angel tells John, the fundamental principle every human being must learn is only God deserves worship. That's why the message of the three angels is the worship God and give him glory. He who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all the things that are in him. So only God demands worship. And so the Bible therefore tells us, when you meet someone or an angel that accepts worship, there are two things to it. Either that angel is the devil, Oh, that angel is God himself. Because a true angel of God will not take worship. Now, let me take you to Joshua, and there is a very fun experience there. The Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 to 15, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite to him, with the sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Joshua was very bold. I like this. Eh? If you found a man with a gun, would you walk to him and ask him, what are you doing here? The Bible says Joshua is very bold. He goes to this guy with the sword and he says to him, tell me now, what are you doing here? Are you for us or again? I think Joshua had gone to show him who he is. <laughs> if he said, I'm not for you, Joshua was ready. I like Joshua. Don't you like Joshua? Where is Joshua? Uh huh. Joshua, yeah, you think you are there. I like Joshua's. They are very bold. So Joshua comes and says to this guy, bold, tell me now before I kill you. Are you for us or against us? And the angel said, the, the man said, hey, this man is bold. <laughs> so the Bible, Jesus, the Bible says, this man says to Joshua, he says, mm -hmm. so he said, no. <laughs> I'm not if against you, excuse me. Don't kill me for nothing. I'm not against you. But for me, I am a commander of the army of the Lord. And I have now come. And the Bible says, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and, and said to him, what does my Lord say to his? Now, what do you expect at that point? The answer I'm expecting is, that that man or whatever would say, please don't worship. I'm also a fellow servant, like you, like the prophets. Worship who? Uh -huh. Let us read those words. They are there. The next verse tells us exactly that. So the Bible says in verse 15, 
Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot. For the place where you stand is, and Joshua did this so. What made that place holy? It must be the presence of this guy. Eh? So it seems that the fact that this guy does not object to worship is simply declarative that this man is God himself. So Daniel sees a man. He's shining. He's glorious. His eyes are like brightening, like, like lightning. His fingers, his legs are like brass. And Daniel faints. Joshua comes with his pride and with his sword and they tell him this is the command of the Lord's army. He says, I'm finished. He bows. No strength. And then the Bible says, I like this. You know this experience? We find it also in the times of Moses. Moses also came and the Bible tells us, then he said, do not draw near. This is by the burning bush. Exodus chapter 3 verse 5 to 6. And, and the Bible says when Moses saw this burning bush, he said, let me go and see why this bush is burning without being consumed. So he turns around and when he comes, the voice from the shrub says to him, hey, do not come closer. And Moses say, why? Then the Bible says, he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is. And look at the next verse. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father. So on the mountain, Moses met God and the statement was, take off your shoe for the place where you stand is. Holy ground. Before Joshua gets to Jericho, he meets a man with a sword. And the man says, take off your shoe. The place where you stand is holy ground. Now, if the other one was God himself, this man also is God himself. And we can testify to that because he does not refuse worship. So in the Old Testament, there is a man who is worshipped and does not refuse worship. And commands people to remove their shoes because in his presence, there is divinity. And this is not enough. Let me take you to Revelation a bit for comparison. Even John was on the island of Patmos and had an experience. This is what John saw. The Bible says, in Daniel, we are told, when Daniel lifted up his eyes, he looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was guarded with gold of Uphaz. Now, in Revelation, the same man appears to John, and the Bible says, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with garment, which is the same as linen, down from the feet and guarded about the chest with a golden band, a golden band. And so it, it seems this is the same guy. And the same man appears to his prophets, to his people, in the same way. And when Jesus appears dressed like that, he's serious. Eh? That is the encouragement. When Jesus comes like that, he's not scary. Eh? But the effect is scary. Because the Bible says, when you read the next verse, his body was like burial, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in the color, and the sound of his word like the voice of multitude. Now look at Revelation. His head and hair were like wool. Eh? This is serious. His eyes like the flame of fire. Torch, flame. I like this. His feet were like fine brass. I like this. Brass and bronze. This is very interesting. I am waiting for Jesus to visit me like this also. How many of you say Jesus must visit us like this? Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Jesus must come uh, and you must be ready for the outcome. Because the Bible says, also his voice was like the sound of many waters. And if you are here the other time, we mentioned that waters means multitudes of people. So the same language is employed in Daniel, the same language is employed in Revelation, and it's the same person, the certain man that comes to these two people. Now look at the reaction which you must expect tonight after Jesus has come. The Bible says, yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me which made me tremble on my knees and on my palms of my hand. Are you ready, my sister, to tremble? Because when Jesus touches you, you can't remain the same. All your pride will seek to go out, and as it is going out, you will tremble. 
And then the Bible on the other side in Revelation says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Kaput, finished. And, 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 but he laid his right hand on, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy. The joy. The joy. <laughs> Daniel did not have joy at that moment. Daniel was dead asleep completely. John was dead, seriously dead. And the Bible says if it had not been for the right hand of God to touch him, he would have no strength. When you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, chapter 2, he also has the same experience. He falls, he has no strength. No one sees Jesus and remains the same. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, brings another subject to get to know this man clearly. Daniel, after experiencing the man, introduces the man in a different way now. The Bible tells us, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, after the experience, the angel says, the Bible says, the angel explains to Daniel why he has delayed to come, yet Daniel had been praying for three weeks. So the Bible says, the angel says, Gabriel, but you know, I had delayed because I was being oppressed and uh, disturbed by the prince of Persia. So I delayed there, and uh, I tell you, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. That's why I delayed. I have come on the 24th. But, behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So Gabriel is saying, I was there wrestling alone, and I was almost being defeated, and the undisputable champion came. Michael, he slapped the enemy until he put them in order. That's what the angel is saying. And then the angel adds in 21, but now I will tell you what is noted in the scriptures of truth. No one upholds me against these things except Michael, yo. So the angel says there is only one person above me in these things. It is only Michael. That's why when I was being defeated, he's the only one who came. And when he gave one blow like this, victory, sure. And that's why the Bible says I can do all things through I, you people, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you are missing a lot. Because this man can really defeat. And the Bible says, in Daniel chapter 12, as the blue causes, also it mentions the same name. The Bible says, at that time, the end of time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince, now here is called the great prince. There he was called the chief prince, eh? chief among prince. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. In other words, Michael is the guardian, you would say guardian angel, you would have called it that way. Michael is in charge of Israel. Michael is in charge of the saints. Everything that has to do with the saints of God, it is Michael. So the Bible says on the last day when judgment is coming, Michael will stand up. And when he stands up, this will be what will follow. The Bible says, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, there will be trouble there. And verse 2 says, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, you can add the book of life. So the Bible says that this man called Daniel, so Michael, and by the way, Michael in Hebrew means one who is like God. One who is like God. Eh? So this Michael, who is the chief of princes, who is the prince of Israel, <laughs> who is also the prince who will stand up in judgment to defend his people, the one who will deliver his people from every shackle of sin and also every shackle of the devil. And so it's interesting that even in the New Testament, Jude alludes to Michael as Jesus. The Bible says, yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not to bring against him revering accusation, but but said, the Lord rebukes you. So Jude tells us that Michael is an archangel. Ark means chief, eh? above, eh? archbishop, one who is above bishops. So the archangel, 
Jesus. And then Revelation puts it even boldly. Because Revelation says in Revelation 12, 7 to 9, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with dragon. And the dragon and his angel fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, the devil, and Satan, who deceives part of the world. Sorry, this Bible, I think the computer is having a virus. Who deceives the whole world? He was cast to thee, and his angels were cast out with him. And in fact, there is a verse there which 12 says, Woe unto you who live on earth, for he has come with great wrath. He knows he has but little time. So Michael, let me put it in picture now so that we can get out of here. Michael, in the book of Daniel, Jesus is represented in three, in, in, in rather two types. He's the son of man who approaches the ancient of days. He's also the man in the linen garment, which means he's a priest. He's also Michael, which means he's a prince, that means he's a king. So he's the commander or the fighter, the warrior of God's people. He defends God's people. So Michael represents the kingly part of Jesus. The, the, the man in the linen represents the priestly, Jesus is our high priest, the priestly role of Jesus. And the son of man of the ancient days is, as I told you, Daniel 7 is the center. So that son of man, Daniel unpacks him and he says he has two profound roles. Number one is the savior. Number two is a king. And we are going to see that briefly because it is very pertinent. Now turn with me to the book of Ezekiel and we see another experience. Let me uh, tell you that Ezekiel ministered in the days Daniel was ministered. Ezekiel was the one sent by God to encourage the people who were sitting by the rivers of Babylon. So Ezekiel says when he was by the rivers, uh, by Cheba, the river, he received a vision and he saw the glory of God coming. He saw the cherubs, they had heads, and one had the head of a goat and the head of the lion, like I showed you the other time. And he saw the territory coming around, but verse 25 is very instrumental. The Bible says, after describing the throne of God, the Bible says, a voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads, that is the cherubims. Wherever they stood, they let down their wings. So those cherubs, when they stood, they lower their wings and the glory and the throne of God is revealed. Then verse 26 says, And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne. In appearance like sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man. Above where is the man seated? And which throne is that? This man that Ezekiel sees is seated on God's throne, which is carried by the cherubs. And that means if this man is seated on the throne of God, that man is God. Or is divine. And then the Bible says in 28, 27, also from the appearance of his waist, and upward, I saw as if it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire with brightness all around. So Daniel sees the same thing. Ezekiel sees the same thing. John sees the same thing and with the same aspects. And then this Ezekiel man who is even bold, he concludes and says, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around this throne. And then he concludes and says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. And that's when he says in chapter 2, I had no strength, so he touched me. And he gave me strength. So Ezekiel sees a man on the throne of God. And he says that is the glory of God. Daniel sees a man with the appearance that is similar to that that John sees in Revelation. So this man must be the same man. 
But true about it, he must be God. Well, let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. The Bible had told us, he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom and power that all people, nations, and language should serve him. And let me take you to Revelation 5, 1 to 7. You see the same experience happening there. Daniel chapter 7 is similar to Revelation chapter 5. And the Bible says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and to lose its seals. So the voice went across the entire world. It went across heavens. It went across the seas. And the question was one, who is worthy? And then the Bible says, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it or into it. And then the Bible says, John cried. He wept and he said, we are finished because the scroll contained the inheritance of the human race. And there was no one ready to take the scroll from God and open it to expose the blessings of God and the inheritance of God for God's people. And so John is perturbed. He begins to weep and as he's weeping, the Bible says as he weeps that, oh yes, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, what is the lion? King of the jungle, not so. So the lion is the king of the jungle. And then he adds, the root of David. Who was David? King. Has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals. In other words, when everyone else had failed to open the scroll and take it, there was one person who has two qualities. Number one, he's a lion of the tribe of Judah and also is the root of David. Now, if you read Romans chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the working of the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, Jesus was the seed of David, who is the root of David. So Jesus is there. And when you read also, the next slide, the Bible says that this lion, and I looked and behold, and in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so this being and power that is able to open the seals has two elements. One, it is a lion of the tri lion and the root of David, and that is symbolizing king or prince. Number two, it has a lamb-like nature, and lambs were used in the sanctuary as offerings. And that means this also is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In fact, when you read John chapter 1 verse 29 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so this Jesus or this man who is able to open the scroll has two characteristics. Number one, he is a prince or king in the likelihood of David and the lion of the tribe of Judah. Because when you read the prophecy that was given to Jacob, the Bible says that Judah was given a scepter. A scepter means the instrument of leadership. So Judah became the tribe that would produce the kings. So by giving Jesus that title of the lion of the tribe of Judah, they were simply saying Jesus is a king. But also by giving him the title of the lamb, it was also speaking that Jesus is the lamb offering for our sins and also is our high priest pleading on our behalf in the heavenly places. And so the only man that can do that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is both king and our sacrifice. That is why in Daniel, Jesus is described as Michael, and the man in linen. Why? Because it's important for you to know that Jesus is not only a lamb sacrifice, but he's also king of kings. 
So Michael represents the lion of the tribe of Judah or the prince of God's people. And the man in linen represents the high priest and that means the sanctuary and it corresponds to the lamb. And so you have in the book of Revelation the two items. You have in the book of Daniel the two items. That's why when you understand the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation becomes quite easier for you to appreciate. And the Bible also says, Then he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And the Bible says, Now when he had taken the scroll, four living creatures and four elders fell down before the lamb, each having a cup and a golden foal, full of incense which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were you slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations. And then verse 10 says, And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Again, the theme comes back, kings and priests. Lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb. Michael, the man in a linen garment. Jesus is intending that after dying for us, he makes us priests unto God. And that's why First, second, first Peter 2.9 says, but you are a holy people. A royal priesthood, a chosen generation. So we are kings and priests in the kingdom of God. Revelation 1 verse 7 says the same, that Jesus died to redeem us and to make us kings and priests unto God the Father. Then the Bible says again, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels. And so that is Revelation chapter 5 verse 11 corresponding to Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 and 14. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. Don't you remember these words? Honor, glory, power in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 and 14. And the Bible says again, saying with a loud voice, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth, the Bible says, and under the earth and such are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard them saying, every creature, every man, on that day when Jesus be, is crowned as king and is given the power to reign, will say these words, blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on and to the Lamb forever and ever. Again, Daniel chapter 7 had been spot on. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. Daniel saw that this Jesus would be given the power as a Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, will redeem many, and out of those many, he will establish a kingdom that will reign forever and ever. Let me summarize it. Daniel chapter 2, the head of gold, Babylon. The, the, the chest of silver, Medes and Persians. The bronze, Greece, the empire. The legs, Rome. And then the toes, Europe or the divided Rome at the time. And clay represents the religious aspect, which Daniel 7 expounds. And when you come to Daniel 7, the head of gold corresponds to the lion, and the silver corresponds to the bear, and also the bronze corresponds to the leopard, and the iron corresponds to the fourth beast. And then in that fourth beast, there is a horn that speaks that corresponds to the clay mixed with iron, because clay represents the creative ability of God. So that power will seek to also involve in this proclamation the essence of being also there with the ability to create and to alter what God can alter. And so it equates itself to God, and that is what we find in Daniel. But in both cases, we are told, as the king was dreaming, as the clay and the iron were still mixing, a stone came and fell, and the kingdom was established. Now, Daniel chapter 7 expands it. He says, while the little horn is busy 
God sits in judgment and he gives all the power to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ reigns forever and ever. In the Adventist faith, we call that the great controversy between Satan and Jesus Christ. Finally, Jesus will reign supreme and the devil will be defeated. The question is, on which side will you be found? And that is why I would like to submit to you, I have heard Jesus say these words, and I am sure you have heard him say so. I have heard Jesus say, I am he who lives and who was dead. And behold, I am alive. For how long? Forevermore. And amen. And I have the keys of heads and of death. And he comes to our modern generation and our modern life where we are busy building skyscrapers and going on high and Jesus knocks onto this present world and he says behold I stand at the door and knock. And then Jesus says if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. And then Jesus says again in Revelation, as he closes the book of Revelation, he gives the final warning and a call, he said. And he said to me, it is done. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Daniel tells us that it will come to a point and where God himself will say, it is finished. It is done. And in the book of Revelation, after the, Jesus has fought with Babylon and mystery of Babylon, he will finally also say, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the fountain of the waters of life freely to him who thirsts. And then he says, he who overcomes, I shall give him an inheritance of all things. And I will be to him his God. And he shall be to me my son. 